Thank you everyone for joining our webinar, How to Be an Ally. Today's presenter is Janine Jenkins. Janine is an HR professional with over 15 years of industry experience. She's an executive coach and public speaker. She served as the leader on HR teams and local Fortune 100 companies and nonprofit organizations. In these positions, she's managed teams and worked with high-level organizational leaders to create high-performing teams that were able to achieve success. This webinar will be recorded and posted on cpshr.us. Um, if you have any questions, please post them in the Q&A section on the WebEx. And uh, again, with that, welcome, Janine. Um, it's a pleasure to, to have you uh, present this for us. Very cool. Thank you, Jason. Thank you for having me. Um, so let's get started. Being an ally doesn't necessarily mean you fully understand what it feels like to be oppressed. It means you're taking on the struggle as your own. An individual from an underinvested community cannot easily cast away the weight of their identity or identities shaped through oppression on a whim. They carry that weight every single day for better or for worse. An ally understands that this is a weight um, that they too have to be willing to carry and not put down, right? So when we're talking about who we're being allies for, um, those oppressed communities can't put that down. I can't take off the color of my skin. Um, and so I carry that with me every day. Um, and so anyone um, that that is has that desire to be an ally has to understand that um, part of that allyship is to carry that weight as well. Anyone has the potential to be an ally. Um, allies recognize that though they are not members of the underinvested or oppressed communities, they support, they make a concerted effort to better understand the struggle every day. Um, an ally, as an ally, you have privilege. Um, and it is important that you recognize how powerful that privilege is and use that um, as a voice alongside um, those oppressed communities. Again, my name is Janine Jenkins and I am gonna be your facilitator today. And we are gonna talk about what I believe to be those practical things that you can do um, every day at work to demonstrate that you too understand what it means to 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 support oppressed or underinvested communities with your with your the privilege that you have in our our time together today um we're going to talk about uh the term ally and allyship and what that means uh we're going to take a look at an active allyship model and just kind of understand the pieces that go into that and then we'll talk about um, how we, the actions that we can take to build, um, to, to be an ally at work, right? We've taken the time to learn what, <clears throat> to learn what implicit bias is and how it can show up at work. And so in this workshop, I really want to focus on what are the daily actions we can execute, um, to ensure that, that we are providing the support development and attention um, for, for our black colleagues and our other colleagues of color, um, that they have worked so hard to achieve. So, you know, again, for today, I encourage you to submit your questions, you know, close out all other applications and join in with me, um, and, and be ready to be engaged, right? So we, we, we're going to be able to protect those, the confidentiality of your questions. If you send them directly to the presenter chat. And most importantly, be open to new outcomes. As we do, as I do this work, I myself am finding new learnings that I can incorporate every day. And so the important thing about moving forward is that when we get this kind of information, that we receive it and that we be open to a new way of doing things. I'm not necessarily concerned about what you did before now. What I am concerned with is what you will do going forward, that you uh, will take what I share with you today and be able to put that to action. 
So what does it mean to be an ally? Um, you know, that is, that's the question. What does it mean to be an ally? And so uh, when we're talking about allyship, you know, one, what we're talking about today is the minimum. Allyship is the minimum. Ideally, we want to be at co-conspiracy, right? So allyship is the, the minimum of what we need to be doing to support our colleagues. We ideally want to get to co-conspiracy. Co um, and, and I say that because co-conspirators are people who are engaged in the conspiracy with another person, right? To be a co-conspirator in this space means to deliberately acknowledge that um, Black people and other people of color, as well as other areas of our uh, diversity um, are are having issues, and when we look at our current society today and what we're talking about around the Black Lives Matter movement, um, that co-conspiracy specifically means deliberately acknowledging that Black people are criminalized um, for simply dismantling some of these um, these spaces in which we have institutionalized racism. Right. It means that when we are a co-conspirator, it means that we choose to take a look um, at, at the consequences of participating in this criminalized act. And regardless of that, we continue forward anyway. And we choose to support and center uh, Black people and people of color um, in, in this movement towards social justice. So, so that's what that's the ultimate goal. But in order to get there first, we should begin our conversation around ally, being an ally and allyship. So when we're talking about allyship, um, allyship is, it, it's, it is a journey and not a destination. Um, it is a lifelong process. And throughout this process, you are consistently and constantly working on building relationships based on trust, consistency, and accountability. Trust, consistency, and accountability are the cornerstones for um, for this relationship because it's gonna it, it it's definitely gonna be needed when we're having some of these courageous conversations that may ultimately need to be had. Another thing about allyship is you cannot be self identified as an ally. You cannot um, identify yourself as an ally. Um, you are identified by you are are identified by others as an ally, and that comes from um, your behaviors. That comes from how you engage, uh, and again, that consistency and that accountability. When we're talking about allyship, uh, it's also about inward and how we grow and how we learn about ourselves. Right, and that building of confidence in others. So when we're talking about allyship, all of this comes together. Uh, and because of these things come together, we are then identified as allies. So again, you know, this isn't about identifying yourself, but it is about engaging in those behaviors where others will look at you and identify you as an ally. So who, who is an ally? So I, I've done some research and kind of compiled um, what it looks like when we're talking about activities as it relates to, to being an ally. So allies lifts others up via advocacy, right? So understanding what are those policies? Where do we see some of, some of these systemic inequalities and how can we um, at least look at that and be able to lift others up um, regardless of that policy? Uh, we share opportunities with others, right? So as an ally, who are you reaching out to? Who are you connecting to? So in the beginning, we talked about, you know, there's power and privilege. And so if you've got privilege, who are you extending that to? Uh, what does, who are you pulling in that may not have access to the network that you currently have access to? Allies also recognize the systemic inequalities and we realize the impact. We realize the impact of when we have social justice issues that are um, 
inequality, inequal because of race or gender or whatever the case might be. We recognize that and we acknowledge that as painful as it might be, uh, we acknowledge that and, and then commit to doing the work to be able to lift others up regardless. Allies listen, they support, they reflect, and most importantly, they change. Um, and again, none of this is, is important if change doesn't happen, right? So all we can talk about, we can read all the books, we can listen to podcasts, watch all the documentaries, have all the conversations. None of it matters if we are not truly receiving the information and moving forward to, to actively change our behaviors. So let's talk about how we do that. So uh, I'd like to introduce to you uh, the active ally model. And so this comes um, from a person by the name of Kyle Sawyer. Uh, and so Kyle Sawyer has done a lot of work um, around anti-oppression um, and education, uh, specifically with the LGBTQ plus community. And so I like this model because I think it speaks um, volumes around um, how we can address uh, all kinds of allyship, especially uh, as we're talking about allyship today. So the first is awareness, right? So looking at how we engage, how are we perceived and what's our privilege? Right, so just being aware of all of that. So, right, that's that that awareness piece. And so, when we're talking about awareness, that's about you know having conversations, getting the feedback. And so, in order to get that that true, authentic feedback, we got to go back to our relationships, right? What is the level of trust in those relationships? And people trust that when they give us this feedback, we're going to do something with it. Um, and actually uh, move forward with change, right? So that's where that relationship based on trust, consistency, and accountability comes into play. Once we've got that awareness, we got to move to action. And so action is going to be around behaving differently, right? So we got all this feedback what are we going to do with it, right? So action is relying on our awareness um, to challenge ourselves, the systems, institutions, individuals uh, that maintain the injustice and behave differently. Additionally to behaving differently, we have to understand why we must behave differently. And so action is going to look different for everybody, right? So action um, is going to be education, right? Maybe it's going to be reading books and, and becoming aware of some of the, the social or some of the inequalities that we're speaking about in your industry or in your agency or whatever that might look like. We're got, we've got to do the work. Um, maybe it's calling calling something out when we hear something that isn't the right thing to do or say and we call it out we're taking that action and we're taking that action immediately right so um i'll talk a little bit later about what that can look like but we're taking that action we're calling out that that is not the right thing to do maybe that action is looking at our policies and figuring out um, what we do, I, I did this training um, a couple weeks ago and I had someone ask a question um, and they their question was around, they had one black colleague in the entire agency and that person was be beginning to feel tokenized because I imagine there were a lot of conversations around what can we do, how can we fix it? And so in that instance, you know, the work is is not on 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 your black colleagues to do the education. The work is on 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 us on our policies to fix it. And my first comment was, fix your recruiting process. What's wrong with with the recruiting process that you only have one black colleague? And so that tells me there that action in that instance is going to be going back and looking at the policies and looking at some of those inequalities that need to be fixed. Where are you recruiting? What does you, do your announcements um, advertise? So all of those things can be action. I think there's a lot of action to take, 
but we do have to take the time to be able to reflect, to honestly define what that action or what the right action looks like. And so once we've engaged in that, that, that awareness and we sort of uncovered that and we've determined what that action is going to look like, we need to figure out how to integrate. And integration is what is going to propel us through the cycle and into a new way of being. Integration is what is going to allow us to grow uh, and become in ways we otherwise would not have been able to, right? So integration is the culmination of awareness through action. Um, and and it, it is the beginning, right? So it is the beginning of moving forward to being a, a different kind of person that behaves differently. So active allyship in action. So how do we put this awareness, action, and integration into action. So I wanna take you through a couple of different, different roles that can be played in the workplace that may help with that. So the first is the sponsor, right? So being the sponsor at work, right? And so when we're talking about um, being the sponsor, we're talking about uh, the expertise that we see in others, right? So how many times have you given a presentation in front of, you know, city council, board of supervisors, agency leadership, and you could do it with your eyes closed? How many times have you done that? And so the question becomes, is there someone else that might be able to help in that vein, right? So, um, are we putting that person forward? Are we sharing that this is someone that that can do the job all just as well as I can? Are we doing that kind of thing? That potentially is what it means to be a sponsor, recommending people for those stretch assignments and those learning opportunities. Um, one activity that um, I I would recommend is the thirty by five by one rule. And so a 30 minute meeting every five days with your black colleagues, other colleagues of color, um, and then spend one minute, just one minute promoting them or their work, right? So how often are we sitting down with, with the folks on our teams? And then how easy would it be to talk about how wonderful and awesome they are for one minute, right? So, so that is a way to, to engage in allyship from the perspective of a sponsor. Allyship is a continual investment of time in supporting others and holding ourselves accountable, right? So, so this is going to be a way that you can promote others. Another role to play is uh, the champion, right? So directing questions about technical topics to employees with the subject matter expertise instead of answering them yourself, right? So um, how hard would that be to say, you know what, I think a better person to answer that question might be this person. Um, you know, and that then goes for, goes toward advocacy, right? Advocating for more of those underrepresented groups um, um, within the team or on the project. Uh, and ensuring that, again, that we're in that development process, we've got people that we can put in that place because that then serves as the sponsor, as the champion. It also serves as professional development. Um, if any of you have, have worked with me before in, in previous courses, we've gone through the exercise of the circle and we talk about um, affinity group, affinity bias and how we have a bias for people who are similar to us. Well, when that sort of goes throughout the organization and the only people we are um, promoting or championing are people who are similar to us, it can, it can lessen the diversity and it can damage the feeling of inclusion. So understanding how recommending people who are different from us, it ultimately helps the agency. The amplifier. Uh, so this is about, you know, when someone has a good idea, make sure they get the credit. Make sure that they get the credit and that it is widely known that it was their idea. 
who are we um who are we highlighting you know when in our our staff meetings and our newsletters right so so are we highlighting our black colleagues and our un other underrepresented groups in these places that are very public the entire agency can see that that potentially our customers and our community can see right that again it demonstrates that we have all kinds of people that we want to share with with the community because and and it highlights how important it is to us um another role that can be played is um, the advocate, right? So advocating for employees of marginalized groups to be invited to key events. Who's going to that, that conference? Who's in that workshop? Who's getting that training? Um, making sure that we've got, that we're looking closely at these lists to ensure that, that we are not leaving anyone off, right? Um, offering to introduce colleagues to influential people in your network. Uh, and and I think this is potentially the the biggest one. I can say from my own personal experience, there is a person whom I met. Um, I met this young lady at an event, and it was an event that, um, and she actually just walked by and said hello, and I said hello, and we just struck up a conversation, and you know, just two people chatting. And then one day she calls me, and she wants me to to uh, speak at one of her events. So I spoke at an event for her. And by speaking at that event, I, by doing, by her asking me to do that, that is an audience that I would not have ever have had access to. I had no other reason in my current situation at the time to have access to that community. You fast forward by being in, even in that position, I met someone else who has also been able to connect me with a community that I would not have been able to have access to. And that is what advocacy looks like, raising people up and ensuring that we use our privilege to connect them to, to environments and places and people that they may not have otherwise had a connection to. And, and once we do that, then we are helping them to not only grow their network, but we're helping them to grow their knowledge. We're helping them to grow their skills and, and who knows where it can go from there. Um, next is the scholar, right? So the scholar is that person that, that does the work, right? So investigates uh, publications, podcasts, social media, and, and pulls that information in. And then we talk to people about their experiences at work. Uh, and so this one, I think, is, is uh, we need to engage in all of these, but I think this one is, is definitely important um, because it's going to help us with that awareness piece. It's going to help us um, as we educate ourselves. Uh, and so take a look at that third bullet. <clears throat> if there are resource groups to be a part of, you know, that could be a way to get some information. And so I would encourage you to, to kind of understand, um, you know, how, how your, your presence might be received in these environments. Um, asking is, is essential because it might be built as a safe space. Um, but definitely understanding that this could be a place to go to learn more and, and to just sit and listen. Um, sometimes these spaces are created for people to be able to share uninhibited. And so if your presence is going to, is going to cause members to censor themselves, I would be mindful of that because it might be to invade a safe space, but I think it's important for you to understand that if this space is there for you to attend, it's going to be a great place for you to sit and to listen and to learn to be able to further um, your your action and your awareness. Um, here's the this is another role that I think all of us need to engage in at some point, uh, the upstander. So before I was talking about how to say something in a way that um, that is effective, this is this is what I was referring to. 
Um, so when we're talking about the upstander, uh, speaking up, if you witness behavior, that is, that isn't appropriate, right? So speaking up, regardless of where you are in a meeting on a phone call, uh, whatever the case might be when it is inappropriate, speaking up and saying something immediately, um, shutting down that topic, especially if it's off topic questions. Um, there was a, a, a instance that I heard of at a medical school where they would have presenters come and speak to the group. And so, um, the group that they were speaking to, uh, there tended to be a time where folks wanted to demonstrate that maybe they knew more than the presenter or to just make the presenter feel uncomfortable in some way. And so, um, the, the. The process or the, the culture was such that when someone stood up and asked a question like that, and it was perceived as such, there was a person that would put up the, uh, their finger like a number 1. And that was an indication that this is your 1st warning. Um, because they did not want to have that kind of environment. It was inappropriate. And so that was an action that would happen. Immediately, it wasn't something that waited until after the event. It happened immediately and in some instances it was public, right? Because the person that was doing it could be seen by the entire room. And so if that person did it a second time, um, the person in the front of the room would put up the number 2. And that was that was their second warning. And so the idea is that on that 3rd warning, they would not be allowed to ask any questions and in some instances asked to leave the room. And so what what can you do in your environment? That is going to sort of uh, create that kind of culture where people know that it is not the right thing to do and you can provide that that feedback immediately. So, 1 of the things that I would recommend is something called the oops ouch method. Um, and so the oops ouch method is when someone says something that is hurtful. Or, you know, inappropriate, it, it is not the right thing to, to do in, in, in this particular environment. Um, the person that is that feels offended or believes that's inappropriate gets to say, ouch. And in acknowledgement, the person that made that comment would say, oops. And, and that ouch is one, it stops the, it, it can stop the conversation, right? Because if anybody says, ouch, we all kind of check to see what's going on. Right? And it, it's sort of a 3 second pause. And then when that person says, oops, that is an acknowledgement. I hear you. Um, I understand what I said was inappropriate and that oops is is the precursor. Precursor to an apology and so it that. When done correctly, that oops is the beginning of a conversation about what was said. Help me to understand what was inappropriate about that. And furthermore, what do I need to do differently going forward? And so that is an example of how you can engage uh, around this topic when it's something that is inappropriate. And I, I feel like it is a way to do it that is a non threatening, but still demonstrates that it's not the right thing to do. And then the important piece is, is to have that conversation in the end. So that it doesn't happen again. Um, but I think this is a way to be able to have that and to, to begin that conversation. And as our organization or as our culture sort of move on and get used to it, people will know that probably shouldn't say that because that that's not our culture. That's not what's what's valued here. So I need to think through that before I say that. Um, so I think that's a way to be able to engage folks in a way that could be non threatening and certain and still begin the conversation about what is the right thing to do and why. Um, the, the, the last role that I, I want to call your attention to is the confidant. So this is another role that I think it's important for all of us to engage in. Um, the confidant is the person that believes others experiences. So this is important because especially when we are talking about issues of race. Um, and, and even, you know, gender, it, it, there's value in, in all of these instances in the workplace. And for, in my experience um, specifically, 
there have been times where there have been things done to me or said to me that didn't feel quite right. And I couldn't quite put my finger on it. And in those instances, to have a confidant to be able to go to and say, so here's what's happening. And here's why I feel it's happening. And for that person to be able to come back to me and say, okay, I hear you. So let's, let's figure out what's going on. And, and, you know, maybe it's, uh, let's figure out what's going on and, and, and just see, right. And, and maybe it may turn out to be nothing, but at least I was heard and there was some sort of question, a query that occurred to kind of figure out what, what about that experience may not be quite right. Right. And so in this instance, the confidant is that person. There are you are working next to colleagues who experience things every day and they can't quite put their finger on it. And, 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 you know, I'm sure some of you have heard of the term micro micro inequities or microaggressions and, and they are things that just don't feel good. And, and being in an environment where they don't have anyone to share that with who will hear them and not, you know, project their own experiences and really engage in that conversation, you know, that that is what's lacking, right? That's what we, we, I include myself, need in the workplace to be able to have that conversation um, because those kinds of instances, um, it's, a cumul it's, it's cumulative, right? And so it's not just the one, it's the many, 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 many times that this happens over and over and over again. And it's it's covered up by, oh, well, that was just a joke or, oh, don't be too sensitive or I'm just those kinds of things um, to have a confidant to be able to go to. Um, it, it really helps in terms of creating um, an environment that feels truly feels inclusive. And it demonstrates a real open door policy because as the confidant, if, if someone can come to you and tell you something is wrong and you address it immediately, um, that feels good. We do this already. We talk about this in our sexual harassment training. If someone were to come to your office and to say, um, I have been, you know, I have been discriminated against or I have been harassed because of my, my gender, we by law, are required to do something. Why not when someone comes to us and say that I've experienced, you know, some somebody doing something to me and I believe it's because of my race, why don't we have the same reaction? And so this confidant, um, playing this role of the confidant is going to apply that same sort of um, attention and seriousness when we raise those kinds of concerns. So, you know, in 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 sort of closing out this portion of our time together, I want to kind of leave you with with a couple of things. So the first is, you know, when we're talking about um, engaging in active allyship, you know, be prepared to do the work. Understanding that coming to terms with your own privilege um, is not going to be easy. Right, that that's not going to be an easy. This is this is there's going to be a lot of of discomfort through this process, but it is necessary to engage in this process and to engage in it um, in a way that is meaningful and that does produce a change in behavior. Don't center your narrative around yourself. Right, so being empathetic is good. We want that empathy. Um, however, this isn't the time to share your personal experience, right? So in those instances, when you're in the role of the confidant and someone comes to you about something that has happened to them, listen, right? When we, when you come back with, oh, well, something very similar like that happened to me, it takes away the severity of the situation and it can feel invalidating. Having these conversations, engaging in this work, there is no place for your ego. 
And so it's important to remember that because that, again, when we have the absence of ego, we can, we can hear and we can very clearly um, get to the business of seeing the action that needs to be taken so that we can move forward. Stop supporting organizations that support hate. When we support organizations that support hate, we are contributing to the problem. Um, and then, you know, in addition to, to not supporting organizations that support hate, take a critical eye to those organizations that say they support, you know, Black Lives Matter or any other initiative but fail to openly speak up for injustice, right? So we've got a lot of folks saying that they support the Black Lives Matter movement and there, there aren't a lot of actions that support those statements. And, and I'm not, that's not to say that nothing is being done, but when we take that critical eye, we should be able to see what is being done. We should be able to see adjustments in policy. We should be able to see, um, you know, efforts to diversify in, in a multitude of areas, right? To ensure that, that they are not supporting injustice, that they are speaking up against it. Keep supporting. So energy and, and um, focus can die down in the media. If we rely on the media, to, to point us to where our, our energy and our focus should be, um, you know, we will effectively get whiplash in some instances. In the absence of, of the media attention, keep supporting, you know, those initiatives and organizations and task force that support, uplift, and further Black people and other people of color. That's how we keep the movement going. That's how we keep our focus on ensuring that the right things get done. Um, in addition to, to that support, we need to continue to do the work. We need to continue to learn and educate ourselves. Um, Black history does not start, start with slavery. No history of any of, of any people of color starts with oppression. Um, black culture is not only what you see on television. No culture of no no culture of any people of color is only what we see in the media, right? So we've got to do the work. We've got to dig in order to find um, the information that we need to be able to do. Um, work that is authentic and work that is long lasting and work that that demonstrates to the people that we work next to every day. That I want you here. I hear you. I see you. I value you. And I want to do um, what I can to ensure that you not only hear me say those things, but that you feel those things in our culture and our environments. Um, and that you see those things, and that you also um, see authentic action that that supports all of that. Thank you so much for having me here today and allowing me to share this information with you. And I hope that I have shared something that was um, very helpful. Thank you so much, Janine. Um, if there are any questions, um, Janine, are you available? Take a few questions. <laughs> I certainly am. Okay, so if you have any questions, please uh, feel free to put them in uh, the Q and A. Um, let's see, I have a few already submitted. Uh, one about the recruiting issue. Person says they hire recent college grads with business slash accounting degrees. Can you identify any resources for them to reach out to oppress groups? They say they already advertise on campuses. Sure. So my question in that instance is what campuses are you advertising on? Um, right. Cause, cause so those are, that's great. The next step is, you know, what about HBCUs, right? So we have a whole college, a whole system of historically back black colleges and universities that also have students that major in those, those areas as well. 
um, when you on the campuses that you are on, how are you targeting uh, the black students and the students of color? Right? There are lots of organizations uh, that are on campus that also have these students uh, that major in these in these um, in, in those same majors. And so I think, you know, recognizing that not everybody goes to career services, right? Not everybody. Um, I think in California, it's called handshake, right? Not everybody's on handshake. And so, yep, we're on campuses, but how do we diversify that outreach? And so your career center partners are going to be super helpful in telling you, who do I talk to to ensure that my message gets to a, a, a wide and diverse population of students? Okay, I have another one for you. Um, how best can we ally up to management without being perceived as a troublemaker? So, I, you know, I think, um, again, remember, allyship is the minimum, right? I need you to be a co-conspirator. So sometimes you might have to engage in that. And so I think I understand that. I understand that completely. And I think it's about, you know, can you advocate for training, right? So, so this is a training that will hopefully help you to engage in the conversation, right? So what are the ways within your culture that you can share this message? Is it about, hey, come with me to this training, or I, I'd like to speak at the staff meeting. I attended um, um, this training, and it, it, so appealing to, to, to leadership, right? So return on investment, right? So you spent the time here. We've paid, you know, potentially paid for you to attend various trainings. And so you want to make sure the agency gets back what they paid for. And so you want to have an opportunity to share, right? So those little workbooks that we create for you in your training, take that and create a presentation that you can share at a staff meeting or, or those kinds of things. And I think um, in that instance, having a multitude of ways that you begin to sort of talk about and share this message up. Again, looking at your culture, how do you do that in a way that is um, effective um, is going to be key. But I think it all starts with a conversation. I'm all for that private com one on one conversation. I think it can certainly um, be the gateway. How do you what do you suggest is a good response when speaking up, but being dismissed as too politically correct? That's a really good question. And I think when we're talking about being, I, I, I would first ask, you know, help me understand what we're talking about when we talk about politically correct, because as a, as a, an, a public agency, um, we need to reflect the community that we serve. And in order to build trust in the community and get the community to do the things that we need them to do, they have to trust us. And one of the ways for them to trust us is to, is for our community to see people who look like them in our agencies. And so I think, you know, um, it, it is inclusiveness and diversity is politically correct. Right, because we serve communities who need to see people who look like them in order for us to, in order for them to trust that we are doing the right things by them. Great. So, uh, I got another one that could be interesting for you to answer. Um, what do you do when you have a direct report who's privileged, um, but that doesn't have self awareness about their privileged thoughts and ways? Are they open to feedback? You know, are they, oh, I got, I got a one line, I got a one line question. <laughs> no, 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 that's my, that's my, that's what I would say. Like, you know, are they open to the feedback? And, and maybe you go to them and say, are you open to some feedback? I'd like to, to sort of chat with you. And, and I am all for you using this presentation as this, as that stepping stone to be able to engage in some of these conversations, right? Hey, I just attended this great, this great training. And so let me tell you about it and then use that as a conversation. I mean, I think if they don't, you know, in terms of privilege, sometimes it's about how understanding how we show up to people. Um, Cause we've all, all of us have privilege in some way, shape, or form. And so getting feedback about how we show up to others is the only way or engaging in this work. I think those are the only ways that you even recognize that you've got privilege. And so I think 
in the absence of them doing the work to understand their own privilege, maybe finding a way or finding a person that can engage in that conversation to be able to provide them with that feedback. How do you rebuild the team dynamic um, when something offensive has been said or done in the past? Talk about it, right? So that open and honest dialogue, you know, I think it is important to acknowledge when things have happened that weren't the right things. And I think in some instances, it's also important to, to talk about, you know, maybe mistakes were made in the handling um, and that you want to learn from it. So what do we do going forward so that it doesn't happen again? I mean, and I think in some instances, you know, trust, the absence of trust makes it hard to rebuild when those kinds of things happen. So I think it's about that holistic approach in terms of acknowledging what may or may not have been done correctly, talking about how you fix it going forward, but also talking about um, what ownership, you know, what's going to be the ownership of the team in terms of I need you to commit to these solutions because I recognize that trust was damaged and, and we got to rebuild that trust. But in order to do that, we all have to be committed to see, to these solutions, right? So even, even um, talking about what to do going forward and getting the buy-in of the group around how we do that so that it doesn't happen again, I think that goes a long way toward that. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, Janine. Um, for everybody that wants a copy of the PowerPoint or uh, you know PDF copy, we'll post that online as well uh, with the recording. So that'll be... I put it in the Q&A section, I believe, but it'll be on uh, cpshr.us. And then if you go to about and webinar, um, there will be a link there, but give me a, a day or two to get it up there. Um, I wanted to thank you so much for your presentation and thank everyone for attending. Um, if you have any questions or need any help with DEI initiatives within your organization, I encourage you to contact us at CPSHR. Again, Janine, thank you. It was very informative and, uh, and I, I certainly learned a lot, so I appreciate it. Thank you for having me. All right, everyone, have a good day. Bye.